The following presentation summarizes concepts presented at the recent first annual International Symposium on Light Curing Sources in Dentistry held at Dalhousie University in October of 2012. Whenever a tooth is reduced in order to remove decay and to prepare it for receiving a restorative material, iatrogenic trauma is induced in the pulp from mechanical treatments and may add to the existing cellular health status of pre-existing pulpal pathology. The components of direct resin-based restorative materials directly over this freshly prepared tooth structure may also adversely interact with pulp tissue. Now, with addition of heat generated within the tooth as a result of light exposure for the purpose of photocuring and from exothermic setting reactions, significant issues may develop within the tooth from which you may not be able to recover. By exposing material to radiant energy, there is a potential to increase its heat. We're all familiar with the use of infrared light to accomplish this. The wavelength of this radiation is below that of visible light, and it functions to increase the vibrational amplitude of bonds between atoms, increasing their potential to collide with one another, resulting in the generation of heat. Within the visible spectrum, radiant energy interacts with matter by raising the outer valence electrons of some atoms to higher energy quantum levels, thus temporarily storing the energy of that photon. At wavelengths shorter than visible light, what we call ultraviolet light, the energy of photons are so great that they were able to successfully remove valence electrons from the atoms themselves, resulting in their ionization. Thus the question arises, is there infrared light emitted from dental curing lights? Here we see a schematic showing the wavelength profile of radiant energy below, within, and above that of visible light. This graph presents the spectral output of an unfiltered quartz tungsten halogen source. As you can see, this type source emits abundant energy in all three spectral regions. However, when the light is filtered for clinical use, there is no infrared emission or emission shorter in wavelength than that of green light. The spectral emission of a plasma arc unit, the so-called PAC light, also indicates very broad emission over this range. However, when the unit is properly filtered, its light output is again restricted to only that within the short visible spectral range, blue and violet. Note that for the blue LED light, no filtering is needed, and its total emission profile falls within the very narrow range of visible light known as blue. There is no infrared radiation. Thus the question arises of how can dental curing lights result in heat generation if they do not emit any infrared light? In reviewing how a photon interacts with light within the visible spectrum, recall that the photon energy is absorbed by the outer valence electron, which is raised to a higher quantum level state. When, at this newer, higher state, if the electron's excessive energy is not transferred to something else, the photon will return to its original ground energy state. In returning to that state, a lower wavelength photon may be emitted, and heat is then generated. It is this accumulated amount of heat that has the capacity of generating heat in the target without the need for infrared light, because the heat is derived via different mechanism. The vasculature of our bodies has inherent mechanisms to deal with sensed local temperature increases by increasing the microcirculation to help remove the warmed material and bring in fresh, cooler liquid. If a local anesthetic is applied to this area, then the vessel's ability to sense and respond to the thermal change is negated. In addition, if a vasoconstrictor is used in conjunction with a local anesthetic, then not only is the thermal protective mechanism inhibited, but the pulpal blood flow, which would have helped to bring in new cooler fluids, is greatly reduced. Perhaps the most quoted paper on the biological potential of increasing intrapulpal temperature is that by Zach and Cohen in 1965, where the potential for developing pulpal necrosis in rhesus monkeys subjected to application of a very hot heat source to the facial surface of a tooth was made. The often cited value of a pulpal temperature increase of 5.5 degrees centigrade is used as a potential danger point where at or above this temperature level there appears to be a significantly higher greater potential for developing pulpal necrosis. A similar study in rat incisors points to the same potential damage with elevation of 5.5 degrees centigrade. The only human study available correlated the subjective perception of pain upon application of heat to a tooth with this intrapulpal temperature increase. Using this data, a higher threshold was noted of about 7.6 degrees centigrade. Many literature reports can be found comparing lights and restorative materials and measure temperature rises, but few have attempted to include clinically important aspects in their experimental design, such as the starting temperature that actually exists in human pulps, application of a pulpal blood flow rate to the tooth, consideration of the ambient air temperature, and the temperature rise directly from heating the thermocouple itself. 
In an in vitro finite element model analysis, researchers at Dalhousie University utilized many factors relevant to modeling the details of a restorative scenario and later confirmed their assumptions using measured temperature value rises in an extracted tooth when subjected to exposure to a dental curing light. The experimental technique used in our laboratory attempts to overcome many of these issues. The system uses an infusion pump to supply water in a physiologic rate similar to that of human pulp into one root of an extracted tooth, which then circulates through the pulp chamber and exits out through the other root. The fluid is pre-warmed in a temperature-controlled bath, so the pulpal temperature is similar to that of the in vivo state. The tooth has a divergent occlusal preparation, and a thermocouple is placed so that it is in contact with the pulp chamber roof, directly opposite the pulpal floor of the preparation. The light guide is held 2 millimeters distance from the cable surface margin, and a solar cell captures information related to the exact time when the curing light is activated and turns off. The temperature profile of a typical sequence of steps involving exposure for a dentin bonding agent, placement and then light curing of a first 2 millimeter thick increment, and then placement and curing of the last 2 millimeter thick increment is seen here. Note that the highest temperature rise results from exposure of the empty preparation. In contrast, observe the difference noticed when the same preparation is restored using curing of a dentin bonding agent and then placement and exposure of a single 4 mm thick bulk composite increment. When looking at the temperature profile simultaneously, it can be seen that similar values were obtained when exposing for the dentin bonding agent because the same light curing unit was used. However, large differences in tooth temperature were observed between the two placement and curing modes, the much lower temperature noted with using the bulk fill technique. However, one must be cautioned here because similar extensive cure of the two restorations might not be obtained. The bulk material might not have cured as completely as did the incrementally placed and cured product. Perhaps the greatest potential for causing elevated infrapulpal temperature rise is the application of multiple sequential exposures without providing for cooling times between exposures. If an easy method could be developed that helped to minimize infrapulpal temperature rise, then clinicians would have one less aspect to be concerned with with respect to pulpal health following a restorative treatment. Here, one can see the potential for a stair-step-like increase in accumulated tooth temperature when repeated sequential exposures are provided to the unfilled cavity preparation. Notice, however, the difference in infrapulpal temperature when an air spray is directed on the facial surface of the tooth for 10 seconds prior to, all during, and for an additional 10 seconds following termination of light exposure. Significantly lower infrapulpal temperature values are obtained, leading to temperature values lower than that prior to light application. This graph shows that the total accumulated energy delivered to the tooth is correlated with the potential for developing increase in infrapulpal temperature. From this graph, it can be seen that, for the restoration used to generate the data, application of 3.3 joules per centimeter squared of blue light results in a 1 degree centigrade intrapulpal temperature increase. Using this relationship, it can be determined that, in order to generate the potentially damaging value of 5.5 degrees centigrade temperature rise, a total of 18 joules per centimeter squared would be needed. This value is not uncommon from that recommended by manufacturers for light curing of a 2 millimeter thick increment, However, the presence of this composite layer also causes lower temperature values because it acts to insulate the underlying tooth by providing a greater thickness between the light spot and the pulp chamber. It seems that clinical issues of potentially dangerous intrapulpal temperature rise values can be minimized by knowing the energy dosage applied during the exposure as well as using a directed flow of air over the crown surface. However, what's becoming a very serious problem is the direct damage caused by light exposure to surrounding soft tissues. When exposing cervical areas of teeth to dental curing lights, it's impossible not to overlap some of the radiation to the gingiva. One study has demonstrated that very high temperature values can be imparted to tissues from contact with the head of the curing light, even if a rubber dam is placed. Clinicians are strongly advised to follow manufacturer's recommendations for limiting exposure to soft tissue from dental curing lights as seen in the directions of this popular, very powerful polywave LED light. In summary then, it's been demonstrated that an in vitro model can provide clinically relevant conditions for estimating the in vivo temperature rise potential of curing lights. Use of a directed airflow over the tooth crown prior to, during, and subsequent to light curing steps helps to minimize the potential for causing significant intrapulpal temperature rise during the clinical restorative procedures using direct resin-based restorative materials. However, results should still be verified using in vivo testing.
In addition, further testing needs to be made on the potential for causing soft tissue damage during photocuring procedures as well.